Uh, Vigilant offers the first true cooling management and control system for data centers. There are a lot of systems out there that will provide you with information about what your temperatures are, whether it's at every server in a rack, top and bottom of a rack, but all they're doing is providing you with information. They may even draw nice pictures that show you what that looks like, and we do that as well. However, we're going to try to, I'm going to try to show you today how we're actually able to manage the temperatures to the rack and help you reduce your cost of cooling on average about 40%. We've done this at 24 Verizon data centers and we averaged 40% of them saving 55 million kilowatt hours a year uh, on those 24 centers. So, I've seen people who have actually done this in their data centers. They've got fans and all kinds of other things trying to manage their cooling because they have hot spots. Uh, we're going to take a different approach. So we're actually going to turn your cooling using your existing equipment into a managed resource. We're going to reduce the overall cost to operate your data center 10 to 20 percent. That's 20, 40 to 40 percent of the cooling cost. We're also going to increase the reliability within your data center. And this is similar to the drawings you saw earlier. And these are DOE numbers at 38 percent for cooling. Most people I talk to claim that number is closer to 45 or 50 percent, but we need to start somewhere. So we're going to address just that portion of your load within your facility. By doing that, we're also going to significantly impact your PUE. A little bit about our company. We were founded in 2004. Our founders, Cliff Federspiel, we were originally known as Federspiel Controls. It was enough of a mouthful that we changed our name and made it vigilant. Uh, we did our first commercial deployment because we do do full buildings as well, uh, although that's not what I specialize in, at the Chevron headquarters. Uh, we were able to show them 30% savings on their building. We then had a client say, I need something for my data center. That's really where there's a need. And we did our first data center deployment in 2008. Uh, here are some of our clients. As I mentioned, Verizon's got 24 installations. We just completed two for, completed the study on the two that we did at NTT Communications, saving them $528,000 a year on two data centers. They're also uh, selling our product in Japan now as a result of those tests. We're going to measure, model, and manage your cooling resources. So we're going to instrument the environment. We're going to install sensors on about every third rack throughout the facility. Our installation is wholly wireless. This is one of our wireless units. So this gets mounted to the top of about every third rack. We then have a wire hider and two sensors that come down from that, one at the top of that rack, one at the bottom of the rack, to provide us with the data that we need. We'll also install similar devices on each of the cracks or crawls within your facility. That will allow us to measure supply and return temperature, uh, energy consumption with a clamp on CT, and will allow us to control the unit. If it's a VFD, we'll control fan speed. Um, today, most of what I'll be talking about is just a simple on-off with a static motor. This is what our installation looks like. You can see the two wireless sensor modules uh, on the uh, far right of the screen here. You wind up with temperature sensors, connection to our wireless control modules. All of those feed back to our wireless gateway. That gets wired back to your network. Our server, although it doesn't look like it here, is actually rack mountable, gets installed in your facility somewhere as long as it's tied into your network. If you have an existing BMS system, we can also tie into that. We can use BACnet, Modbus, other methods. So if you already have sensors or controls deployed, we don't have to duplicate that. We can utilize existing equipment. Uh, we do this in conjunction with Raritan. We're in the process of working it out. We have Synapsense and some other companies that provide a lot of the monitoring, but they don't do the control. Each one of our wireless sensors is ultra low uh, power consumption. The batteries on these last four years. We monitor battery life in our software. Batteries last that long because it either goes to sleep, wakes up once a minute, sends out data. 
because it's a mesh network, they're all tied to each other, so it's fully redundant. And that goes back to the wireless network. If you decide that you want to add another set of racks and we need another sensor, you just put it in and automatically joins the network and ties in. This all has full security with 128-bit encryption, MAC address uh, identification, as well as operating on an 802.14.5 uh, with roll, automatic rolling channels. So it's uh, highly secure. We passed all the protocols for vigilant several banks and so forth. Here you can see our wireless module on top, the wire header, we did that in white. We actually have black ones, but that was so you can see it. And where our sensors go, VFD control we would install here. Uh, we would install inside the unit if it were not VFD. The way that we do this is when we first turn on our system, we actually turn, make sure that every crack, which is normally the case when we walk into a facility, that every crack or cry is run. We then turn one off for 15 minutes. Wow. Didn't sound that didn't sound good. No. We then turn one off for 15 minutes, and we watch what happens to the temperatures in the room. We turn that unit back on, turn the next one off. We then use that to create a map of what the influence of each one of the cracks within the facility is. In this case, this facility is actually State of California's Gold Star facility, which is the equivalent of their co-location. State owns it, they host uh, 500 different agencies in this one co -op. So they're running CRAWs, here you can see the influence of this CRAW. And with our system, you can look at every CRAW or crack within your facility to determine what its area of influence is. Here you can see what crop B does, and finally what crop C does. Actually, this should be here. We then take all of this and put it together to create a single map. This shows you in real time what your facility looks like. Now, unlike many, we're actually going to now manage the temperatures. We're going to turn or hold off cracks. And we're going to determine which ones we don't need based on a predictive model. So we look 15 minutes ahead and say, if I turn off crack A, am I going to force any of the racks to go out of range? If the answer is yes, I don't turn it off. If the answer is no, I do. Now, because we are adaptive and dynamic, if that prediction is wrong because suddenly you're in a colo and a customer stuck five more servers in a rack and turned them on, we're automatically going to adjust to that and we'll turn that unit back on. But we're trying to reduce cycles and keep them at a minimum of 15 minute spans. <clears throat> through this, we're also going to help you optimize the temperatures throughout your facility, looking at floor tile placement, perf tile size, um, things along those lines. You'll see this area on the left that's bright blue. That actually is owned by a law enforcement agency in California that won't let anybody walk in there to change the size of the tile. So that stayed that way, and they know it's incredibly inefficient. There's nothing that can be done about it. If you roll over on the screen any of the cracks, you're going to see your supply and return temperature. We're going to indicate to you if the unit's on or off as per our system. Of course, the delta T is going to be very low if the unit's off. You can roll over any of the green triangles you see there and get the temperature of the top and the bottom of the rack. Now, red isn't necessarily bad. That means warm. You may be allowing an area of the data center to get to an 80 degree level. You may be experimenting with a portion of your data center. So you don't have to set one temperature for everything. You can set the temperatures rack by rack. And we can adjust. So if you have an area that's legacy equipment that can't operate at higher temperatures, you can keep them at lower temperatures. If your SLA with your client requires you keep it at a certain level, you can do that. And it can be different for each rack. So we're using input-output data model that's all adaptive, it's all self-configuring. The only input we have to provide is what the sensors are, what kind of crack it is, whether it's chilled water, DX, and whether it's a VFD, and we have to locate all of those sensors on the diagram, which is provided by the client. After that, there's not much to do. You give us the set points, top and bottom of the rack, and walk away. System manages itself. So there's an opportunity to adapt and learn and see what's going to happen as you make changes within your data center. 
This is Crow one in this case. This is the influence of Crow one You can see it actually causes some areas to get a little bit pink, causing a minor increase in temperature, which most people don't realize happens quite frequently in data centers. If we look at what Crow 3 is and where it's located, you can see its area of influence is really quite similar to Crow 1, even though they're on basically opposite sides of the room. So we had a discussion with the client to help them figure out how to optimize this, and we suggested that they put in cold dial containment in this area here. And in doing so, that's the result. When you change a floor tile placement or size, you can immediately see it on the screen so you can see what the impact is, because this is all real time. This is a before and after shot of that same Gold Star facility I showed you earlier. So before we walked in the doors, they were, they were operating at an ambient temperature of 72 degrees. Most of the racks were blue. We were able to go in and operate at a rack intake temperature of 76 degrees and show you what this was. So we were able to accomplish a four degree increase, maintain the temperatures that they wanted at the rack, but the rest of the room came up in temperature. So we're able to much, manage it much better. Now here's a question. If I turn off, on average, 45% of the cracks in the facility, what do you think happens to the temperature in the room? Anybody? I bet it drops one to two degrees. Now this happens, and most people will sit there and scratch their heads, but this happens for a variety of reasons. One, I'm going to increase your return air temperature, which is going to increase the efficiency of your cracks individually. I'm going to provide you with better airflow. Because typically when you design a data center, you're going to say, okay, I want to serve two megawatts of IT load. So I'm going to put in X amount of cooling. Then I'm going to add more for redundancy. And everybody's afraid that at 2 o'clock in the morning, a crack's going to go down, and nobody's going to be there to turn another one on. So all of the cracks are running. Now what happens? The velocity of air going through your system is causing blow by. Your servers can't draw in enough cool air to cool themselves because the air is going too fast. I kind of equate it to sticking your head out the car window at 60 miles an hour. We're going to make your units more efficient. We're going to make the temperatures of the racks go down one to two degrees and give you much better efficiency. We're going to reduce the number of cycles. Here's an example where you had a 57% reduction at that Gold Star facility in cycling. Uh, On-off avoidances here, we went from about 5,100 before our installation to 3,100 after. In this facility, they have 29 cracks. 12 of them are off. Two of them run intermittently as we need them. We bring them on for supplemental 